हेलो एवरी वन दिस इज मालिक एंड वेलकम बैक टू अनदर एपिसोड ऑफ लेट्स एंड वाइंड This is episode four. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have come to episode four. It is almost the end of March. Oh my God! So much has happened. I know. I I don't know what has happened because we're <laughs> in February, but I hope a lot of that's not what we decided. We're gonna be talking about, but that's fine. Yeah. I, well, we are recording this in February now, so we, but we hope your March was very eventful and so was ours. Happy. So will ours be. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But today we have another special guest. Uh, we've had three guests so far. They all have been from different walks of life, from different industries. Mm-hmm. Really lovely conversations. Today we have someone very, very, very special on Let's Unwind. Uh, we have my very, very dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she basically uh, has come from New York. She was in New York for six, seven years, I think. Uh, she was studying econ at NYU, which was my dream university at one point. <laughs> Did not really get it. But anyway, uh, now she is in London. Yay! Uh, she is an account manager at Vimeo. Uh, has been working there for quite a while and doing extremely good for herself. Uh, interestingly, I met her at a networking event, <laughs> uh, and I think we've met a lot of people at networking events. So, like, if you want to meet people, I think that's the new way to go. Yeah, yeah I, we did talk about like you know just putting yourself out there and. And going to networking events to meet people, right? In like a, a previous season, I think. So yeah, so just do it. Way. But anyway, I met her at a networking event, I think, a couple of months ago. But she is just like she's like us, and you will know why in like a, a quick second. So please introduce, or uh, please welcome, uh, Malika <laughs> Nair to Let's Unwind. Hi, Malika. How are you? <laughs> Sounds like we've been talking already. <laughs> How do you feel? Do you I feel anything? good. I mean, I've never done a podcast before, so this is very interesting. I'm very excited to join you girlies today and um, chat have, about. Yeah, just, you know, just chat around. Yeah, yeah about I'm everything. very excited. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I think everyone's very intrigued to understand about a bit more about you, your background, where you come from. <laughs> so yeah, just. Um. So I grew up in Mumbai, and. Was there till I was eighteen, and then went to NYU for my undergrad, uh, econ, as yeah. you mentioned, and then Vimeo was my first job out of university. Yeah. Um, I worked in the New York office, I want to say, for like two and a half, three years, and then didn't sadly get the H one visa. Let's not talk about it. But, <laughs> um, I didn't get it, so um, kind of it, Vimeo was quite supportive about like, what can we, how can yeah. we help with like yeah. your next step? So. Um, London. I knew they had an office in London, so I—I I mean, my options were like either I leave or go to India, or I do a masters, or I do like hopefully they're okay with like yeah, sponsoring, sponsoring me London, to London. Yeah. It all just worked out quite well. It was just a very difficult time because it was all during the pandemic, and right. you know, it was just a very difficult period to be yeah. an international student worker, whatever, <laughs> in the US yeah. at the time. Um, but it worked out, and so I've been in London for the last two years. I'm um, still with Vimeo, um, and yeah, the, I actually hit my two-year anniversary mark in January, oh which is God. insane. It's been a while in London, but for people who do not know what F1 is, it's a lottery system, right? Like in terms of yeah. So when you go to the US, you go on a student visa if you're obviously studying, and it's an F1 visa. Okay. And so if you have a, if you're doing a STEM degree. After you graduate, you have three years to work in the U.S. Oh, and so that means three attempts at the lottery. But if you're a non-STEM degree, you get like one year to like work after, and hopefully you get the H one, which is the work visa. Right. So like to be able to work beyond the whatever great like years you get on yeah. your student visa, you have to get an H one visa. So it's a lottery. It's a lottery. It's like, not like the U.K. where a company can just apply for you. You have to kind of. Ballots for it. It's like uh, obviously the company like applies for you, but it's like a it's like a preferential lottery system wherein there's no guarantee. Like in the UK, if you have a good application, yeah. everything's clear. Like there's no reason for you to get rejected. Like you probably will get it. Mm-hmm. I also feel like post Brexit, it's quite beneficial for people like us to come to the UK, and it's been a lot of different types of visas which yeah. make it quite easy. Yeah. But in the US, it's very much like a lottery system. Mm-hmm. Um, the kind of job that you have. Have gives you an edge in terms of whether you get picked or not, oh, and then depending on the job market, like if there's 
certain types of jobs that are like high in demand like jobs that maybe Americans are not really trying to do right. something that I randomly found out like long distance truck drivers is like highly in demand in the US and like not a lot of people are doing it locally I actually heard about that before yeah and really? it gets, you get yeah, paid pretty that. well it's not bad dude they get paid about like 70 80 thousand dollars a year which is like a lot more than a lot of people in the UK so Honestly, I've been watching so many Instagram reels and this is about like the Indian context. A lot of people who are street vendors in India, yeah. they earn a lot more than like artists. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Artist people, like it's quiet. You're the second person this week telling me this. I went for a networking event on Thursday and this girl said the same thing. She's like a big foodie and she was like, yeah, if you like the street vendors who are popular in India and yeah. like really get a lot of business, they make a stupid amount of money compared to like salaried workers which you think like oh yeah they probably earn more it's, it's just not like, true just for context like i think annual like salary is like five thousand quid okay. pounds in india for like normal like white collar job a lot of people street vendors actually they make a thousand pounds a month just by selling food on the streets and it's like on the road right they have like maybe like a small, a small table, <laughs> like yeah. a high top table. Yeah, the costs are low. Right? The costs yeah. are very low. Extremely, exactly. I mean, they're, if they're popular, you know, like people are coming every single day. It's Their like, operating cost is like the food. Exactly. They don't have like yeah. electricity. Or <laughs> Not I don't know. I don't know. But zero. yeah, so there's like great margins if you like figure it out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like so, um, for someone like me. Where it was, um, you know, my background was econ. Mm-hmm. I was doing tech. Then they have like broad categories, like for each one, in terms of like where you fit. So for me, my type of job would be within sales and marketing. Right. Sales and marketing isn't considered like a, oh my god, like the pinnacle of you know, you know what <laughs> Americans need from like in terms of you know external mm-hmm. hires. So. Um, I just very realistically, to be honest, I knew my chances weren't the best. Okay. Obviously, there's way to like maneuver it and do it. Like I, I know people who've done it and figured it out, but I had very early on made peace with the fact that I may probably have to move. So um, I spent the last year instead of like pushing for like the lottery, mm-hmm. I was just like, let's talk about London if that's an option. Right. And so it took a long time to figure it out. Honestly, like mm-hmm. Vimeo is, it's a, it's like a you know, it, I, I sometimes call it like a big baby. Like during the pandemic, it w- did phenomenally well because video became from like a, of course, oh, like a m- nice to have to like a need. You know, businesses needed a virtual way to like exist. So Vimeo went public. Like all of it happened during the pandemic, and so it grew really fast. Mm-hmm. But it's not like a you know like the big consultancies or the investment bankings where they literally sponsor people in batches you know so it was not a thing in my company so i really had to like go to a lot of different department heads and be like hey like i'm thinking about this like what do you think like can i get your blessing and they were like oh sure but it was like not getting communicated to the next person maybe like i don't know it's just like it's not i I think it was being figured out maybe at that point so it did finally happen they did do it It, i was very, very like supported in the entire process which i'm grateful for and um that's how London happened like you as long as you have a strong application like you should easily get it but the US it's different well what would you say is the, the chances of success in getting a visa in the US I'm pretty sure it's like a don't quote me on this but I'm pretty sure it's like 10 15 percent chance of getting picked that's what I last heard for the h1b it's quite tough and that that's why the multiple attempts like helps that's mm-hmm. why you know if someone's doing a degree in the US like I would recommend doing a stem degree like you get three years is another year exactly you get three yeah. attempts versus one um, obviously there's other ways to circumvent it right you could get on the I think it's called the EB5 visa which is like an investor visa I know a lot of like um, kids who you know maybe their families have helped with that and mm-hmm. it kind of helps cement your um, track to getting like a green card in the US it's not a bad option if you can like leverage that for you so how long were you in the US for? I was uh, seven years wow. yeah so I was in New York for seven years. I went there when I was like Four at the ago. end of my 17. Yeah. 17. Yeah. I, I <laughs> what am I saying? Like you know a what week I mean? before I turned 18. So I came here at 17. Exactly. But I turned 18 like a week later. I'm exactly. Like, oh, like three you weeks know. before I turned 18 is when I got okay. to New York. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And you spent four years in university and yeah. three years in the New York office yeah. at Vimeo. Yeah. It must be a big change though. Like I've been in London six years and I'm moving to Dubai. For me, it's like heartbreaking. Right, right, right. And for you, like, did you envision yourself to be in the US for like 
you know what? I actually thought I would come to the UK. I thought the really? UK was my vibe. So I she was manifested like, it. <laughs> I literally, when I was applying for universities, I was gung ho about the UK. I was like, I think it's more my energy. I can't imagine myself in the US. But weirdly, I, I mean, my parents were more keen on me going to the US, like yeah. much more than I was. For some reason, I could not envision myself in the US. And so I obviously applied, like I applied to the UCs and like all the Ivies and all, <laughs> <laughs> all, whatever, like the best universities. My dad was like, if you're not going to get into a top 10, like don't even bother asking me. And I was like, okay. Oh my God. Uh, very, very like Indian dad about it. But uh, so I applied NYU and UCLA were the two universities that I just had like I don't know if you girls like relate to this, but I just have like gut feelings about certain things in my life, like certain things, certain people. And NYU was one of those things where growing up, every time I would see NYU like anywhere, like on TV or like if it was mentioned, I'd just be like, Ooh. you know, I don't know Same. why. Same, it was my dream uni. I didn't get it and I got waitlisted. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's also, I feel like NYU is like one of those movies that just, sorry, uh, universities that gets used quite a lot in movies Bollywood shows. movies? Yeah. So yeah. That's all you know since you've like, born, like been born and gotten up. So like yeah. that's why. Maybe. maybe that's why. I don't think like, I maybe took it as like a deeper than whatever it needed to be. But I was always like, I really wanted to do NYU and then UCLA was kind of there as well. Um, but my parents were, weren't too keen because I went to boarding school for like five years and lived a very very protected life like right. a very and so they were like you will die if you go to NYC <laughs> like you will not be able to hack it like all of the they were just concerned about my safety right of and then so I secretly applied to NYU oh you didn't tell your parents about I didn't it. I definitely didn't tell my dad like I was it was not something we had a conversation about and I got into NYU it's so funny like I the so NYU's rejections come first yeah and the rejections and wait lists come first. So in boarding school, I'm pretty sure it was like a Saturday. And I was like, oh, um, I went to the dining hall. So I throw boarding school. <laughs> like we had dinner. So we went to the dining hall and all the guys had applied. And there were not as many girls in my grade. Mm -hmm. And I think I was the only girl who applied yeah. to NYU. And all the guys were like buzzing and talking. And I was like, what's going on? And they were like, oh, didn't you hear like NYU's rejections came out? Like oh. everyone got rejected. And one guy got waitlisted who objectively was smarter than me, had better grades, like there was no denying that. So I was like, wait, I didn't get any email. And I was like, wow, I'm so pathetic. <laughs> they didn't even bother rejecting me. Wow, like this is, I was like, did I even submit my application? Like, they didn't even bother I'm like, yeah, I'm, and I'm a very expressive person. So like the minute everyone's like chatting at me, I'm like computing my entire life. In that moment, I was like, wait a minute, why the hell did I not get this email? And I remembered like the girl's dorm at the time, the Wi-Fi wasn't working. So I was like, oh, maybe that's why like I didn't see an email. Yeah. And like I'd snuck my phone in, now I can say it, but like I snuck my <laughs> phone in at that point. I like rushed to the dorm and looked at my email like I, on my phone and I was like, I haven't gotten anything. So I'm like doing the walk of shame <laughs> to the dining hall and I was like, wow, I am not getting anything. Because the guy who was like objectively smarter than me, he's waitlisted, why the hell would I have gotten in, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just like, whatever, it's fine. And then I remember we like after dinner went back to the girls dorm, like we were just chit chatting, like whatever. And at 2 a.m., I had this gut feeling that I should check my email. So random. That is crazy. I checked my email and I see the acceptance letter from NYU. Wow. Cried. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is it. And I like, I like called my dad and I was like, I got into NYU. And he's like, you applied to NYU. <laughs> And he was like 2 a.m. You know, he was like yeah. in the deep of his sleep. I think he probably thought I was dying. That's why I'm calling you. Say, you have your phone. You applied to NYU. You like, like all of these things. And I was like, okay, let's chat tomorrow. You did everything you're not supposed to do. And everything, everything that I wasn't. So he was like, and then I, I think the next day I was like. The, I was maybe happy about NYU for like 40 minutes and then I was like stressed as hell because I was like, oh, I haven't applied for a scholarship. Mm -hmm. NYU is stupid expensive. Right. Just the tuition, I'm pretty sure, was like $76,000 Yeah, it was like around $80,000. Like 80000 like depending on the college school course. U.S. universities are insane. crazy expensive. Insane. Like, insane. Yeah. Horrible. So like, and on top of that, it's an NYC private university. Like, of course, it's going to be expensive. We didn't even. There's so many costs outside of that, like dorms, books, like all living of the, expenses. Your living expenses. Yeah. 
so i think the next day it was a very like sobering moment when i realized like what the hell have i actually done here so i remember like my friends were really supportive and were like you know um i think we had like prep time it was like a sunday i again <laughs> so we had time. to study for like 3 hours <laughs> okay and so like the um the they were like all my girls were like announcing oh my god like malvika got into nyu crazy and i was like Yeah, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, I was like, am I actually going? No, like yeah. I don't know. It is a yeah. big, like you know, investment. It is a lot of, in, like it's a big investment. Like I don't know, and so I was happy about it. But at the same time, I was very okay with the fact that, like, if potentially it doesn't make sense, they're not okay with it for whatever reason. Yeah. It's safety or anything. Like sure. I would be open to having that discussion, not like push them too much on it. My parents, and so it. Um, all worked out well in the end i think my dad he's a big like he'll do his research and he's very thorough with it and he did his research and was like this would be an amazing opportunity for you obviously he was concerned like i'm his only daughter like i did grow up very sheltered mm-hmm. but i appreciate that he trusted me to like hack it and not kind of get lost in like the craziness of new york so yeah i think that's the one thing about you know like for 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 us girls or guys you know who go into a different country you know that go overseas to study abroad or yeah. work abroad i think the foundation between behind us is always like a supportive family yeah. yeah like if you don't have family to support you from behind i think you know it 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 probably wouldn't work out the way it will yeah for us absolutely like there has to be so much trust on both sides exactly. like you can hack this like you can figure it out so um yeah i'm very grateful like i would have never in my wildest dreams imagined like Oh, at 18, I'm gonna go to New York, which was like such a far stretch from my boarding school. There were like 300 kids. Like it was a very small community, mm-hmm. and f- going from that to something like NYU, where the city is your campus. There's no like, bound, there's no campus. It's like London University. It's like, yeah, it's but like even hurt. worse, yeah. you know. Yeah. So it was just like very, very scary. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I never imagined that. It's having a leap of faith, you know, like having trust. Like as you said, like I think with Hull as well, like it's in the middle of the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There is no campus. Like right. London is our campus. Mm-hmm. So like even I, I think that's why we relate so much because even like we come from like extremely supportive backgrounds. Yeah. yeah. Right. And like I am from Patna. Like, yeah. It's a very very small town in India. My father literally told me when I told him at like 16 that I want to go outside to study, yeah. and all my friends were like going to like Indian top colleges and they're very very cheap. Yeah, so Indian best right. colleges are like two fifty pounds a year. Yeah, mm. that cheap. He literally told me, and we come, we came from a comfortable background, but not affluent in terms of like, yeah, we can like pay eighty thousand thousand for like pounds mm. per year, right? Mm. He said, write down the number that you need every year, and I will do everything in my power to like make you like go wherever you want to go. Yeah, I think that's same. That's that's the same thing that goes for me, right? Because in my Entire life up to the point I went to London, I had actually never imagined myself out of Singapore. Mm. I had never imagined a life overseas yeah. uh, until one day a friend dragged me to these like overseas fairs, and she was like, "Yeah, I'm thinking of going to study overseas. Like, come with me." And and that was the first time studying overseas like even came into my mind. And I was right. like, I didn't even know there was this option, mm. you know. And I think it goes to show because. To be fair, the only reason you know I I wasn't a straight A student when I was back in Singapore, mm. right? I didn't have the best grades, and you know you know all the universities in Singapore, right? All three main universities: the National University right. of Singapore, NTU, yeah. and uh, Singapore Management University (SMU). Yeah. Like those three are like top top universities in the world. Right. They're very competitive, both locally and internationally, mm. and like um, those were universities that obviously I unfortunately you know. Didn't really make the mark for. Mm. So I have, you know, I sometimes shamefully admit that the only reason, probably, why I went overseas was because, you know, I couldn't get into the universities in Singapore. Mm. But because of that, right? Like people will say, you know, you're spoiled, you're, you know, you're lucky, you're privileged, you're entitled. Mm. But I think also at the same time, like all that entitlement comes from a very supportive background. You know, mm. my parents really supported me throughout my journey. And of course, it comes to a certain time where you tell yourself, like, you know, you're, you're. Throwing a lot to yeah. go to a different country right. to to succeed, and you know there's no turning back. You yeah. go there, and there's no turning back. You have to succeed. You right. know? There's a lot of pressure on on your end as well. You know, you go into a completely new environment, a new life, new culture, everything, and yeah. you just have to go with the flow to it. Yes. Yeah. 
I think it also comes with a sense of like I need to give back ASAP as well because yep. they're putting so much investment and trust yeah. into my staff. Like they, I need to like be the most excellent when there is in the campus and get the best job and earn the most money so I can give back and like not ask for money. Yeah. Like, did you deal with the same pressure? Like when your dad was so supportive, like said between you and your work. Um, I I did feel a lot of pressure about like making the most of this opportunity. Yeah. Um, I think like. second year onwards i'd already started looking for jobs like even during the semester because you typically do your internships yeah. like during the summer every year and that's kind of the typical at least of what i knew if yeah. my friends were doing right but for me i was just like i just want to be able to pitch in in whatever capacity it was a combination of like help but mm-hmm. also like get that job experience like yeah. you can constantly work on your resume and make it better so right. i was looking for like jobs on campus mm-hmm. um to just give that added cushioning for my like month to month expenses so um it's not like it's an uncommon thing but weirdly like um like for americans it was quite common to explore those additional like mm-hmm. work things because you either need it or whatever yeah. but from like a lot of the indians from india that was not a thing like they yeah. weren't like necessarily trying to like so early on like freshman sophomore year like trying to get a job like while studying their like priorities were just job. different yeah like it just it's just different like it it depends like where your headspace was at at the time but yeah. for me i felt like really really like uh stressed for different reasons so i was just <laughs> like okay i think i'm going to like work yeah. and just um yeah during the semester as well yeah yeah no i did, i did quite a bit of work when i was uh, when i was in uni as well which university did you go to we we went to halt okay so uh, you all knew you all know each other from halt yeah from university ah okay okay got it yeah, got yeah. it so i think i was i was very lucky i was in my first year and then i did i did retail and all things actually oh uh, yeah did you get discounts huh i was going to ask <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, for the for the, the for the sake of the podcast, I don't uh, I don't think I'll go into detail about oh, like yeah. why I left. But I only went only for a month. Right. Um, but due to like the increasing, because I I literally got the job within the first two months of coming to London. Really? Wow. Yeah. So literally within the first two months, I I started finding a part time job. On your student visa, you could do a retail job up to twenty hours. That's interesting. There were more yeah. restrictions in the US. I could like, not work, yeah. for example. She could. Because uh, I think I was very lucky. My visa came right before they made changes with the new policy. Ah, so when okay, I came, okay. she yeah. came in 2019. When I came right. in 2018, like I could not work. In 2019, they came with the new policy right. that international students can also work for 20 hours a week. That's yeah. crazy. So I could not work for four straight years. So my job was in a Spanish company because that's EU. So uh, after Brexit, those rules did not apply. So luckily, I could find work. Okay, okay. But it took okay. me three years and Spain to find a job and nothing. Mm, yeah, interesting. Yeah, but I, I was very lucky because I, I, I mean, I left because during that time, like you know, I started joining, um, I started joining like clubs and yeah. you know, school work got a bit more. So like, I left within a month. I was, I really wanted to continue though, but I had to leave. Uh, but I was very lucky during the COVID period. Like, were school to, offered some jobs. As well. Were you able to buy something when you were there? Huh? No, I could. Yeah. <laughs> life in New York like NYU actually like yeah. there's a big shift right like did you feel like alien like coming to a new place or did you all all my place meet people and you're like I'm why big with everyone how was the adjustment to the culture there yeah. to the people it was very 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 tough yeah. like for me specifically like I used to consider myself like not a very and I've told Malika this yeah. before like not at all a social person like I'm not outgoing I'm not I don't know how to like crack on with other people like immediately mm-hmm. i would need to like know instinctually like you are exactly my vibe for me to like be that friendly right. i think now because of my job which <laughs> is like talking to people from literally every strata of life like yeah. now i have a lot of confidence like you could be anything anywhere i will figure out a way to talk to you right. which is like a very valuable life skill but at the time i was like no very reserved and again like i was coming from such a small background like small such a small school to something like nyu where you're interacting with the students yes but you're also interacting with the city mm-hmm. so there's a lot that's happening that was like insane to me also india is a very homogenous country mm-hmm. you know there was no concept of like introspecting on your race your identity <laughs> yeah. like all of these things yeah. like not at all um so going to nyu it was just like a lot like i remember 
you know filling out applications like the race stuff like you know it's introspecting mm-hmm. like oh i guess i'm asian i don't like relate to that but sure yeah. but you know things like that like um talking to people from so many different walks of life um navigating the city like using public transport like knowing how to interact with people from different cultures like yeah. it was a lot for someone like me that mm-hmm. was just like operated on a very like one wavelength in terms of things you know right. so um i struggled a lot my freshman year i will say it was a very difficult time i was very very like i, I don't want to say um depressed i feel like that's a very strong word yeah. but i do i do think i struggled quite a bit and i kind of you know went in my shell like i wasn't really trying to i was just like i i would just stay in the dorm it's a bit overwhelming bit. it was a lot like yeah. it was a lot i also think i was so keen on not making like the exact same kind of friends that i had back home i was like oh i want to diversify but i didn't know how to like talk to people um so i feel like especially that first semester like i didn't really like have a lot of things happening for me like socially i was just mm-hmm. like trying to figure out like how to even navigate things and thankfully there were like one or two friends that i really clicked with towards the end of the my freshman first semester and yeah. that's when things started like picking up yeah. but that first semester was chaos like it was too tough and i really did think that man i think i messed up like coming here cuz you know i don't like as like the asian mentality is like look at the ranking like look at this look at like the job prospects all of these things mm-hmm. you don't think about the external things yeah. like is this your vibe like do you want a city campus do you want something a bit in the between something rural mm-hmm. do you know what kind of life do you want what kind of opportunities will you get things like that you don't consider as much i wish like we i thought about that a little bit more um just to be prepared like for what yeah, i'm getting exactly, into you yeah. know um but it was uh, i think there was a part of me for very long that i was like i wish i just gone to like a campus esque university where yeah. i could get that security a little bit more mm-hmm. i never saw people on like a recurring basis so there was no like friendships based off of that like you right. had your friends in your class for some reason that friendship never extended like outside of the class like i don't know if this was like an nyu thing but we would like joke about this like we would be dear friends in the class and the minute you step out it's kind of like okay you do your thing i do my really? thing really you know i don't know if a lot of people relate to this this is yeah. my <laughs> experience it was really odd okay. like um but i actually like studied abroad right. my sophomore year first semester to solve for this cuz i feel like i was i just could not figure out my vibe in new york and i was like maybe if i study abroad it's a smaller yeah. community of nyu people i like figure it out then and like going there studying abroad there I made like a solid group of friends there which so when i came back to new york they came through them. they came through those friendships came through like i'm still good friends with like a lot of them even now and like that kind of helped me make more sense of nyc like as the years went by but it was an incredibly i cannot emphasize it enough very difficult like move for me yeah because a lot of people don't even stay with you like i think they stay in their own places like in the city i Is think with dormitories for the first i mean i would say for the first two years a lot of people do do the nyu dorms Dorm, and right, so okay. we all did that i moved off campus like my third year okay. um and i stayed with some friends so yeah um yeah it's like i would say moving off campus kind of happens mostly around junior year yeah yeah i would say that's the same for i will, pr- perhaps all all universities as well yeah. yeah yeah you usually stick to the dorms in your first year right because you know you make the friends there yeah. and then from meeting those people and making new friends yeah. and making new connections then you find people that you vibe with exactly. and you move out together yeah. exactly i think that's the usual go to yeah. yeah i think it's the same for everyone i think even for me like i question my decision. i had a list of calls on my transfer to in my first week of college like i was that like i'm over it like i just do not relate to anyone mm-hmm. maybe it's not my vibe either like people yeah. are coming from like places that i'm like i work so hard and like people are coming here just like chill and stuff like i do not think to relate to that yeah 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 and then it took me a while to like meet my group of people yeah. be involved in the school and then be like okay like maybe i can like work this through because i really like this place yeah. yeah i think it takes that myself like i've put in so much work that so many people behind me that i have to like get through this so yeah you just have to kind of like fight through the noise but initially it was like too much was like thrown at me which it was a lot to navigate as yeah. someone like nyc objectively is a lot for an 18 year old yeah. of course to m- navigate when you've come from like a like the kind of environment yeah. i did like i wouldn't even consider myself like a big bombay girl like you know which is it's a very it's a city again yeah. but 
I just grew up very like protected, yeah. so I I wasn't like going out like that. So for then something like NYC, it was a lot. Like ah, uh, I mean I don't regret it. I think it like forces you to grow up. Right. And so after doing New York, for example, like I did, I wasn't nervous about London. Like yeah. I was not nervous about hacking London. Obviously, I had a good support system that helped, but I wasn't like nervous about hacking it as a city. I was like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. Yeah, whatever. Like, if I could survive New York, I can survive <laughs> London. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely for sure. I think like in terms of chaos, New York is probably much more chaotic than London. Oh, a hundred percent. Like especially yeah. post the pandemic, I would say it's like a, like a lot of chaos. Like your even just moving about in New York, it's like a thing. You have like your New York like face on, like you. You're not like New York face on. Like it's kind of like you walk around and you're. It's not a very friendly city. Like you're not. You know, you you meet all kinds of crazies like in your commute or like just kind of going about. So you very Straight much have face. to like be in the zone. Like no one's like smiling at each other and be like, hey, "How was your day?" No, it's not the wrong person. Is it? No, done exactly. No. Like oh yeah. Really? One time I was. I just happened to. I just looked up. I wasn't. It, I just happened to make eye contact with some guy. And he thought that that, and I was walking. He thought that was his like window to approach me, and said some weird shit. Like he was just like, um, he was like, I'm actually like, uh, he was definitely on some kind of drug. He was like, um, can I ask you something? I was like, yeah, sure. And he was like, I'm looking for a band aid for my pet dinosaur. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and I was like, and he was like, yeah, can you see my pet dinosaur? Like he's injured. So I was just looking for a band aid for him, and I was like. You just kind of have to humor those conversations. Like you can't, yeah. like you can't do or say anything. I was like, no, I'm sorry, I don't have a band aid. Like you for your pet dinosaur, anyone, you, yeah, can't, you can't, you can't offend, offend them. them. Not at all. And it's like no. crazy on the road. Yeah, you it's, cannot you can do that. You risk your life if you like offend. Someone. Yeah, I just feel like that like crazy energy just kind of went a bit. It was like a bit escalated post the mm-hmm. pandemic for many reasons, and so yeah, it's like it's a thing. It's a thing. Like you just kind of like do your thing. You're not like. Yeah. Chatty Sally to like everyone. <laughs> no, it's like New York zone is like just keep walking and like do your thing. But how's the you know when you move from New York to to London, right? Like, was there? It's another. It's another change, right? Completely another yeah. different continent. And yeah. As well, how would you? Do you have any friends here? How do you make friends? Like, how do you get yourself adjusted to the London culture and environment? I have had a decent number of friends from like back home in yeah. New York, so it really touch like. I don't know if touch was the right word, but like thankfully it was not a problem at all. Like acclimating, and I stayed with my like my best friend from call from high school. Um, so it and she like sorted a lot of things out for me as well. So it, it really was not an adjustment at all. And I think the basic like structure of like a city, like using public transport, like the vibe of how everyone interacts here. Like you have many groups of friends, and then you have your individual friends, and you plan things like weeks in advance, like. Those things were very much how things existed in New York as well. Right. So it was not an adjustment at all, like culture socially wise. and those things. Culture wise, like I didn't find it. For me, it was like talking to people that was a bit more shocking. So I felt like I'd finally nailed like how to do the American small talk, and I was like, I can do it. I've got this. How? how if you don't mind, give us an example. How does the American small talk work? I don't want to offend. It's not a bad <laughs> thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just like it, I don't think Indians like do small talk as much. Like. It's a we- it's a different kind of small talk. Yeah. American small talk is very like chirpy, like it's very like it's just a different vibe, yeah. and like it's very different to Indian small talk. Mm-hmm. And so it took me a minute to figure out how to do that, especially yeah. like how to do that small talk in a work environment. Okay. Very difficult, and like on top of that, out of three out of the two three years that I was in New York working, two of them were like during the pandemic. So it's just like. Weird social things were happening just about when I like figured it out in New York. Then、Maybe、I came here, <laughs> and then London's like a whole different ballgame. Like my office, it's I would say it's more European than British. So、yeah. everyone's like quite friendly with each other,、mm-hmm. and like every the you know the work drinking culture is like a. It was a massive culture shock to me. I was like, "What the hell? Like, why?" There's no drinking culture in America. There is, but like, I, no one's like, "Oh, let's go to the pub on a Monday." Like, that's not a thing. Like, not at all. I think it's more serious. I think than Europe. Like, sure, Thursday, like、yeah. Thursday, Friday, like sure, but definitely not like a rogue Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> or Wednesday, and definitely not on like a weekly basis. Like, I think my coworkers like it's not weird for them. Like, they're like,、yeah. "Oh, like let's go to the pub after work." I'm like, no. I have a Pilates class, or like I have <laughs> other things that I want to do. Like no, it was. It took me a minute. So for me, I I think I just found a middle ground, like 
Mondays to Wednesdays it's just I will never entertain that like yeah. after work drinks but if we want to like chit chat after Thursday work like sure you know yeah and then like how like people communicate here how small talk banter big mm. freaking word used here all the time yeah. that was very different compared to and i feel like i could lean a, lean a little bit more on like on my indian sensibilities to like talk to people yeah. over here yeah so that was like those were the things that i felt like i had to adjust to like work like the interactions and like how everything was yeah i think from my experience here people want to know a lot more about your life oh 100% like work. the personal details yeah they would love to know about your dating life and yeah. what you've done yeah. and where you're going and like in detail yeah like there's no boundaries no like boundaries. None, none at all in the us it's there it, there is a boundary yeah. okay. and you can you can be friendly but there is an invisible film of like okay there's going to be we can be so chatty and we can talk about the weather for 500 hours and yeah. like the weekend yeah. but it's not going to go past a certain point of course you'll have like your close friends yeah. Yeah. but in the uk work culture it's so common to go like really into the depths about yes. like your work <laughs> life your like sex life like yeah. all these Everything. different things and i'm yeah. like wow it took me a year i would say even even now sometimes i'm like oh we're going there okay like <laughs> <laughs> the culture shock is just too much for me sometimes and like for me it's like not just new york it's like indian you know the indian work culture is like so ma'am esque like there's a hierarchy yeah. Yeah. you will call your manager so obviously i don't like think of things like that in that capacity but it's like for me it's like work is work my friendships work friendships yeah. are work friendships like there's a boundary i don't know life is private life work is yeah private. but now i'm i'm much more like a lot more chilled out about it okay. i actually consider a lot of my coworkers like Friends. good friends yeah okay. yeah That's good. Yeah, I'm I'm someone who strictly believes that work is work and how really? to life. Maybe really? because like I haven't, you know, like like you said, it takes a while to acclimate to that yeah. surrounding, right? But I think it's also about like what's the age group of the people around you as well. I think That's when true. I was working, it was very very young people. People my age, you were like three years elder, mm-hmm. so you could easily relate to one another and like just being on other shoes but when it comes more like it's like 40 45 like then it's like this yeah it's like, different yeah. yeah and it's just the culture of the office as well can be 100%. that makes or breaks like i think vimeo just had like a cool chill vibe. i chill <laughs> so everyone's quite friendly with each other at least like the london office mm-hmm. but the new york office it's a bit more like um it's friendly but mm-hmm. i don't think it's as like chatty pally as like the uk office yeah I think it's easier to like do banter like in the UK because you just talk about the weather in the first two minutes and you're like fine like I'm yeah. just like eased yeah. out in the conversation yeah. stuff right yeah. now so it's That's easier. another thing that I was like a bit of a cut. I don't know if you relate to this, but in India you're not sitting and chatting about the weather for no. so long. No, no, no. no, no, no. This I, is such a western thing like to talk about weather massive. and you can have a 10 15 minute conversation about it and I'm like properly wow. involved yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You It's, have a new chat about the weather every time you had a conversation meeting, with a new person. Yeah, yeah, every Zoom meeting would have a better conversation with the weather. Yeah. Yeah. Every single one. It's common. It's, It's like so common. It's so common. You would never never see that. Good. It's not going to happen in Dubai, so that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you have like a three cues you're like okay got it I'm your friends now <laughs> in Asia it's not no yeah, no, no can't it's friends, like, we can't be friends especially in work settings you don't do small talk and like they don't that. even appreciate you asking questions not about personal life like not for them all. business is strictly business like let's get into like the matter immediately now. like even being like hey how are you how's it going like those things they are not, not, answer. not at least not in India like it's, no. I don't think it's a no, thing like I you just get into like, business yeah I, I'm like hey how are you and they like it's like no I'm no. not sure they're like What are you here Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I think it's just the difference between culture, between like an Asian culture and like European, Western. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. Yeah. It's very, very different. Very so, different. Yeah. There's very strict hierarchy in Asian culture. Exactly. Very strict. Yeah. Exactly. So, finding that middle ground of like what you grew up with versus mm-hmm. like this different experience that you got and then you come here and it's like another different thing. So, yeah. it's a lot of mental gymnastics like That's to true. figure it out and obviously you don't want to come across a certain way or yeah. like you don't want to you know not be in favor in like in good regard with your co-workers but it was it was it took me a second to like figure it out but overall i would say like london i wouldn't say it was like a difficult transition transition not, not at all not after new york but it's like yeah it's lucky because you you transition to learn from new york but exactly. I, i reckon of course when you're when your initial um transition to new york from india i believe horrible yeah. yeah but it got better but because of that i think london was a lot easier and it does help like having a community mm-hmm. i'm a big community girl like i don't know i'm not you know i feel like there's some people who are like 
I'm a lone wolf. Like I can hack anything yeah. and everything. Yeah. I'm not that person. I need a community, not just like one person. I need like five different people for like five yeah. different <laughs> things. Yeah. And I thrive off of that community. I've realized that about myself mm-hmm. at this age. So um, it the fact that I had that over here, and you know, obviously since I've made so many new friends, like Malika is like one of them. Which like at a networking event. Very random. Very random. Like, honestly, like we didn't even expect to one another. I was talking to some like a group of women. Yeah. That's the dishwasher, by the way. Oh, I thought someone <laughs> was something. <laughs> <I know. laughs> oh, no, was it was your brother. The dishwasher. No, I'm, she just. I think she just joined the conversation, and you were just like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna join this conversation right yeah. now." Yeah. But I had a gut. See, I told you my gut feelings. I saw Malika, and I was like, "We'll be friends." Oh. I just had a gut feeling. It's so weird. I've had this about the random people in my life, and I'm like. I can just tell like that we will like I or, I don't know if it's like if it'll go somewhere but I was like I need to talk to her I don't know why and I think she just said like I said I'm an account executive and she's like I'm an account manager we're like oh we're in sales together like yeah. tech sales girlies yeah. and that's how we started talking and then we just spoke to one another and then I think I was meeting her actually that day so I told you when I meet a friend imagine oh no way that was, that was me I was screaming at her because I, because I was late she had dinner plans yeah and I told yeah. her like I'm so late I was talking to her yeah. no way and then she was supposed to and also you live so close to me like that yeah that was also crazy because I live like two seconds away from you yeah so, she was telling so me so yeah. she was like let's just walk home I'm like no I have to meet a friend and I'm like when she's gonna scream at me and she did scream at oh me oh my god but, she, but she is someone I was supposed to meet imagine crazy small world look at us doing a podcast <laughs> <laughs> Three or four. No, it's been a while. It's been six months. I all I think we it's met in the summer, right? Summer time. Because that was been a, yeah, that when I was going through my existential crisis of like, what the hell am I doing <laughs> with my life? That. Like, so I was going for like a lot of networking events, and right. that's when, yeah. 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 Oh, what was your existential crisis all about? Don't mind sharing. Yeah, um, I think it was <laughs> yeah. just like, um, let me, give me a mic. <laughs> I. It was just like in general. I think I. I Turn twenty five. I no, turn twenty six. <laughs> Shit. I I feel like COVID dropped us of two three years. So no. I'm operating off of like twenty four energy. Don't say that. Don't say that. But you are twenty four. I know, but like I felt like I missed out the twenty one, twenty two. You you you. Life. We just like yeah. got robbed of that time. So mentally, I just I'm like, there's no way I'm turning twenty seven yeah. this year. I feel like I was. Anyway, that's <laughs> but I th- it it wasn't even like a networking for jobs thing. It was more like networking about what am I. What's my goal here? Like, mm-hmm. what am I doing yeah. beyond? Like, my job affords me a lot of financial security, which I'm very, very grateful for. And I think when I was just understanding the UK market in general, I was like, I don't know if there's a lot of jobs that afford you that, especially when there's like a sales angle to it. So I think for me, it was just like, okay, but are there other ways to like stimulate your brain? Right. I wouldn't say I'm not gonna sit here and be like, account management is my passion. It's not yeah. like. It 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 does it it's taught me valuable things, but it wasn't like men like soul fulfilling. So I just had a bit of an existential crisis, and um, I was like working with a career coach, and she was just like, "Oh, you should go for like networking events and like talk to people, and you never know." And so for me, it was more like, "What's everyone doing? Like, what's the vibe? Like, yeah. what is everyone like doing with their lives?" And for me, the biggest thing that came out of that was Money Branch, like. Um, I met this. Uh, I met someone at one of the networking events who was developing like a personal finance app and on the side doing um, hosting like a brunch once a month mm-hmm. for women to talk about money in like a very safe space, like talking about investing, saving, mm-hmm. like just financial planning in a safe space where there's no judgment, there's no expert preaching at you. Like this is what you should do with your yeah. money. It's just like different women, different walks of life talking about. You know, this is what I'm doing. Like, if you want to think about that, so it's not like uh, it's it's such a. It was like when she told me about it, I would it like literally in my soul, I was like, this is amazing. I want to help. So I literally was like, can we grab coffee? Like, I'd love to talk about this a little bit more. And so we met for coffee, and I was just like, can I help? Like, what can we do? Like, what do you, what is your vision here? Like, blah blah blah. And I think she was stretched a little bit thin because she was working on the app as well. Right. So we talked about. Um, uh money money brunch and like i kind of helped from more like an operating perspective like different things and so from june or july like i've been helping her with these like once a month brunches and we talk about like different topics and all of these things so it was like don't get me wrong i feel like the existential crisis never stops but at that time i was just like my job is not like soul fulfilling me if that's right. oh yeah, it is, it is a thing. It is a 
it's just like I was just like I needed something else so money and like I I used to consider myself like I kept joking I was like I don't have any passions I don't have any like things that I'm like I you know I don't have like a clear thing that I'm mm-hmm. like really good at and really want to do you know I'm just like sales is so vague right mm-hmm. so I used to really put myself down about those things then I realized like there's concepts that I'm passionate about like I'm passionate about like the concept of like financial independence for women that's a very very important topic to me like I stumbled into investing yeah. I found out about investing through TikTok mm-hmm. my family never talked to me about it not because they didn't think it's important but they were like oh like you know maybe in some time like not she doesn't need to start investing mm-hmm. at 21 at 22 like maybe that was their thinking about it, I think so but I got like I would see on social media people being like if you have ten dollars to spare you can invest yeah. that and that in the long term could be meaningful money in something right versus it just sitting in a savings account like yeah. I feel like I've derailed massively but the <laughs> no. point is the point is, is just like I, I I was like I hate that you know I found out about investing through social media just kind of in my cocoon then like did whatever I could understand yeah, yeah. wasn't talking to my friends about it wasn't talking to my family about it and made some mistakes that could I could have potentially avoided so you know the concept of money brunch to me was like insanely attractive because I was like yes there needs to be more conversations yeah. about money it's not a taboo topic you should absolutely be setting yourself up for success and like there shouldn't be this fear about like being proactive about your investing and money and all of these things so I like for me the soul enriching thing has been like helping with this like in some capacity um, and it's it's been it's been great it's like helped a little bit with like that existential crisis of not knowing what to of what yeah I was yeah. just like you know I, I, I really it was not a nice space to be mentally being like oh I have no passions I have no this I have no that like I felt like my nine to five was defining most of my week yeah. and that's not that's not how I wanted to feel no. so it was a very interesting summer like putting yourself out there like going to yeah. these networking events and all of that um so that's kind of how you got into sales and why entry didn't I stumbled that. into it I didn't have a job <laughs> <laughs> I was recruiting when Trump was president it was a very very limited pool of options yeah. right. and so I think I, there was like NYU hosted this like job fair yeah. and Vimeo had a booth and I just like dropped my resume and they reached out like many months later oh, wow. um, just being like oh we have this position like do you want to consider it I was like you know I don't even care sure <laughs> I will take it I like did my first round of interviews and she like asked me some questions and I like I'm a nerd so I like basically learned the website like by heart I was like yeah like Vimeo is all these things like blah 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 she's like so this role specifically I don't know if you've like completely like this is the vibe of the role like this is what it entails and I was just like you know what I just don't even care like sure like I will I will take it and got into it and I think the first day of my job is when I realized like wow this is like not at all what I expected it to be yeah. I never in my life assumed I would do like tech sales ever no one does because especially <laughs> as an SDR like, that, that's the worst you started with the SDR thing I started as an SDR yeah, it's, it's, it was it's horrible not fun. To, for, for our viewers what's oh, sorry, SDR sorry so in sales yeah. you have to do there are three departments but like there is new business which is basically you bring in business to the company yeah. Yeah. there's account like customer retention account management where mm-hmm. you Retain the customers, take care of them. Like, as I'm just private, and I can SAS. Mm. SAS sales. Yeah. Mm. I was an account executive where, like, SDR is just like senior development, like sales development representative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they send emails and they cold call. Mm-hmm. There's two types of SDRs there's like, there's inbound and then there's outbound. Outbound, right, outbound right. is people who, like, they cold call. Uh, inbound, they have like a fixed list that they work out, out of. They're like qualified prospects yeah, that you right. can reach out to okay. that the marketing team has spent like millions of dollars to like yeah. get those prospects yeah. for you um so i was an inbound sdr which was right. you were an inbound a SDR? bit better oh than God, like outbounding yeah. uh, no, in the sense for me with my social anxiety that is really that, yeah that's that's better than cold calling yeah so like that's why for me i was very clear i could not be an account executive like for me i was like please account management Did like you the <laughs> stress of like i was like i want to deal with like a manage like what like an expected book of business yeah. I know what I'm operating within yeah so um yeah I very much like stumbled into sales it was not like I imagined myself to be like someone in consulting I don't know why I was just like oh sure like prob- that's probably what I'll do especially yeah. with an econ degree and then I think in that year specifically like the big four companies it was pretty bad like they were not sponsoring as ma- many like international kids even if they were it was like very specific departments like tax and 
something something yeah. else that was well beyond my you know like my econ degree could never yeah. you know yeah. so it was tough like i it was just i just kind of had to take what i got yeah and you stuck with it yeah but do you like it i i think um i do and i don't like i i think it's like one of those things where i so value the skills that i got from the job right. being able i i do this is my personal opinion like i feel like everyone should do sales like for some part of their life it teaches you how to talk to people yeah. it is important to be able to learn how to talk to people in like a like a meaningful way yeah. instead of just like nervous chit chat yeah. chit chatting right like sales teaches you how to like effectively communicate with people and to get that experience early on into my life like i think it was a very very valuable lesson obviously then there's like financial incentives as well which allowed me to be very very independent for the since i've started working like completely just managing things on my own um but i wouldn't say it's my passion like i don't know if i would like do this forever yeah i don't know how many sales people i think once you get once you get into sales the trap is the money so it's very hard to hard to I get totally out of it it is yeah. very very hard like when you start looking at other jobs other salaries it's like how can i compromise 30 40% of my salary like is it is it worth really it. worth that yeah. kind of switch right mm-hmm. so you have to feel so convicted like the deep sense of conviction about moving to this yeah. other field that's my other existential crisis it's mm-hmm. like because i don't have like a field or a role that i'm mm-hmm. like this is exactly what i want to do to the point where i'm okay to compensate that much on salaries like those things i think about like quite a bit so um i think like once you get into sales it's tough to get out of it like that's the whole talk on, on the block like it's it's hard once you get in to get out i think it's also because you basically manage how much you make like you have full control over how much money you will get in your bank account every single month yeah, yeah. and it could be thrice or four or five times the salary like it's that yeah crazy. like if you've had a good month you can uh, like make a good 10k a month easily and that's what, like, but it could also be like a 2k month like it just there's a base obviously yeah. but then it could be like fluctuating in that yeah. spectrum the commission expects the commission right. really yeah it's it's the selling point and that's why like it's just so lucrative as a career exactly. but it is like it affected my mental health yeah i i with sales after 2 years of tax season i was an account executive through right. through and through so i was never an scr like for four months right but like for me like my life was dependent on my clients and my deals and i just could not stop thinking or switch off if i go on holidays if i go on like my parents anniversary wedding celebration right did you have a base or it was purely commission I, no, of course i had a base <laughs> thank god, god. Oh my god imagine <laughs> no 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 i have a base but like still because you know there's so much money to be made yeah like you just can't stop plus also like sales are very much like a leaderboard like every single day yeah you are asked how much money will you bring in this month yep. yeah yep. like a kpi is a it does a kpi measure, also i think yeah. in sales like it's so easy to measure how you do as opposed to like the intangibles yep, yep, of yep, the yep, job yep. that really affects your mental health like how many calls have you made how many emails have you yep. written and yeah. that like i'm like you treat it as like a number and robot on the block sometimes that's mm. my personal opinion that's yeah. why it just literally mess with my mental health yeah I think that's why when the AM route cuz it's a little bit more like customer success yes. mm-hmm. and customer relations like customer re- retain retention and retention. like customer success like making sure they're getting the yeah. full value of the product like being able to work closely with the product team yeah. the solutions team sometimes marketing legal like you're wearing a lot of different hats and I felt like at that point when I was up for promotion I was like I want to go the AM route instead of AE because AE is like you're doubling down on the The sales aspect of it which sometimes is like the least favorite part of my job like it's really stressful it's really hard like i think some people are naturals at it like they have that vigor and acumen to do that and continue doing that and not let it bog you down mm-hmm. i don't know if i have that like like i'm fine at this age like it's fine yeah but like long term at like 45 50 i'm like i don't know yeah. like, <laughs> no, i don't know no. if i want to be like you know have these like insane targets on my head because as you get promoted yeah. you have bigger targets bigger like more strategic yeah. accounts like you're really trying to like milk out the opportunities yeah. versus it being given to you you know so yeah it's a, it's a tough tough space to be in for sure but you said like you know you're 9 to 5 so you're 9 to 5 right you know that's exactly. your source of income and yeah. then on the side you're still you know still trying to find what makes you tick you know like what your passion 
what you're interested in, you know, actively doing and stuff like that. And like you said, you know, the the money branch which you were working on. Yeah, right? I think there's a big misconception that your job has to be your passion. I thought that I would yeah. keep saying to people who like clearly knew their passions and their jobs yeah. were in it. I was saying, you're so lucky. It's like a gift from God that you're doing yeah. it. But sometimes, like your job is just your job. It doesn't have to be. Like what defines you, yeah, yeah. it can serve a purpose, and it serves a very meaningful purpose. It funds my life and gives me an independence. I'm very, very grateful to my job, but it's not what enriches my soul, and that's fine. So you can find other ways to like do that. You want to take up a sport, like do that. You want to work, do some community work, like do that, yeah. or find an activity that enriches your soul, and you feel like okay, I've walked out of this like mm-hmm. this week feeling just. Better yeah. about myself. Yeah, but I mean, there's so much talk, right? Like these days, like there's so many young students or young graduates who come out and be like, okay, I need to find something that I thoroughly like,、yeah. you know, and not something that you know is just giving me the money for、right. to work towards, right? So how do you balance that? Because you know, you're nine to five, something that just gives you the income to live, right? right. To to thrive off. But how do you balance between thinking that okay, this is my nine to five, this is my income. To a point where is this actually meaningful or not? You know, how do you balance that feeling? Because I'm pretty sure you know that's when your existential crisis came. It's like, is this really what I want to do?、Yeah. Is this serving my life purpose? How do you balance that feeling? Because you know, you know that at the end of the day, this is something that you're doing. You're getting a lot of skills from, but it's not exactly meaningful to you. Right. But you know that you know I'm only doing this, you know, because it's serving me a purpose of financial independence. Right. So how do you balance that that two emotions of like does this serve my life purpose but I'm doing this for financial independence or stability? I think you just have to introspect on your circumstance, right? Yeah. At different stages in your life, there's different like external factors and internal factors that matter.、Mm-hmm. As a student, you don't have as much information, like、right. real data points to like pick from. So you kind of just roll with the punches and like stumble into something, and you you still have a little bit of hopefully. Or maybe support from your family,、yeah. or you you just like you know your situation is what it is.、Yeah. There might be a little bit more cushioning around like what your choices can be at that point. Then you work for some time and you realize like there's different things that you want to like consider in your life, and then then your priorities just become different. So I feel like it's con- like being complacent about your life is like the biggest misjustice you could do to yourself.、Mm-hmm. Introspecting on like and checking in with yourself like based on the circumstances、yeah. of my life right now is is this making sense? Is what I'm doing? Making sense.、Uh, there's a lot of people who are very okay with the slow life and like doing, you know, a certain type of job, which is a certain, you know, there's maybe a ceiling there or it's just a certain vibe and、yeah. going with that flow. And then there's certain people who constantly need to like. I'm that. I think all three of us are that kind of person. I'd say, okay, like what next? Like,、yeah. what am I? How can I like do better? How yeah, can yeah. I, you know? How can I contribute? How to, can to the world to my life? Exactly.、Know? And like for me, my circumstances are unique to me. Like I. Want to be able to be a hundred percent financially responsible for myself.、Right. So then you have to make certain decisions, right? So if you want that kind of like、yeah. ability to be so responsible for yourself, then you have to make tough choices with like your career options and things like that. Would I want to do a job that I'm like, like yeah, I'm so passionate about this?、Yeah. Of course, like in an ideal world, like everyone wants that. But you have to be realistic about your situation and check in on yourself. Like where am I at at this point? And then as you like grow older. Bigger things, right? Like, okay, where do I want to be in life, right? Like, do I want to settle in this country? Do I want to start a family? Do I have a relationship? All of these things, which you should never, you know, I think your twenties, you should spend being very like selfish about yourself because、yeah. you'll never get it back. Like, think about yourself, operate for yourself. You,、yeah. You're the only person who can have your back. As you like inch a little bit older, you're like, okay, there's these external things、mm-hmm. that I'm thinking about a little bit more. Um, how does that then play into my career choices moving forward? So I think I'm definitely at a point where、um, I'm starting to think bigger picture. Like I'm happy in the UK、uh, so far,、mm-hmm. but I'm also like starting to question like longer term.、Yeah. Right. Is this the place for me? Like is is this what I would want to do?、Um, am I okay with? I don't really have like a family support system over here. Like I have friends, but I feel like a lot of my close friends. Inevitably, in the next one to three years, they're going to move out yeah. Yeah. of the UK. So, obviously, you can create a new support system, things like that. But I don't have my family here,、mm. so I don't know how I feel about that. Especially like when 
I want to eventually start a family. Like, am I okay with that kind of life where, you know, I go to India like once or twice a year and like my family, they'll come and it's like, a, I don't know. I don't know. Like, it, this is a very big, this is my current existential crisis about like where for some reason when I was in the US and the UK, I, I always used to think like longer term, like when I have a family. Can I actually imagine like raising my kids here? My kids here. That's what I'm in the US the or UK. I could not. Like I still I could never. And this was like, as a kid, you can be like, okay, sure, I'm, this is my judgment now, but mm. I'll get over it. Yeah. I'm like, it's I'm been abroad for eight years now, and I still cannot wrap my head around like if I had to really start a family, mm. am I okay doing that in such a like isolated sense over here? I grew up with like a very strong support system like I was the only child around that time so like my grandparents were really involved my mom's sister was very involved I met like I had a lot of cousins and all of these things and so there was like a big support system to help my mom out and my dad out you know Um, and then I see my um, certain like members of my family who moved abroad Mm -hmm. and then they settled abroad and when they had kids abroad what it meant for them it was like okay we can come for like a couple of months then we go back and then you have to figure out in isolation a lot of things and that can work for you if that's like fine for your value systems i'm not sure if that works for me that like isolation i I just can't imagine it but for my 20s and for this like single pringle life (laughs) sure i love it you know the city life is honestly the best yeah I feel yeah. like a lot of us like have this pressure on ourselves, especially now, like yeah. with the competition that we have to have everything figured out. Yep. But like, I feel like the, you're an example of how it is okay to still figure your life out as you like move along. Yeah. I and think it's like we're all doing that. Yeah, yeah. It's okay to like not like know, like I don't know what I want to do, like, but like I'm moving some, but like figure that out and like that's all right. It's okay to not have it all figured out. Yeah. And I feel like there's so much pressure on having that perfect job. But my friend also told me in the band, he's like, Malika, a job will always be a job. Yeah. It will not be a perfect job. A job is something you have to do regardless of you like it or not. Yeah. So don't put so much pressure on like having a job, but just like make sure that you know what you're doing after that job is also fulfilling for you. Yeah. Right. And that just makes everything all right. But yeah, I think that's a very good summary of today's podcast. Yeah. I, before we end the podcast, I do have a few questions for you. Yes. But which is, uh, could, could become across a bit controversial. You just... You <laughs> controversial but you know I'm like you know asking the hard questions here right okay. you just said like you're not you're not comfortable not say comfortable but you're you're still figuring things out yeah. right you still are going for the ride right, you know right. s uh 26 going 27 year old I yeah would say. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like as a 26 going 27 year old like would you say you're content with your life how it is now oh my god <laughs> Okay, I didn't know this was a therapy session. <laughs> what? Uh, I'll be a free therapist. <laughs> um, am I content? Yeah. Would you Would you say you're content with what you have right now? Ooh. If you asked me a month ago, I would have been like, no. I think when I was in like December, I was just like, I'm gonna put my life on pause and just figure out everything when I come back in Jan after my holiday. <laughs> so, but I was entering, I was like every year, mm-hmm. every year, the 31st of December, since 2018, I've been like reflecting on my year and how it's been, what I learned and how I will get into 20, yeah. the next year, right? I was reflecting on my, how I was feeling on that day. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I am really entering 2024 with zero ideas of <laughs> what I'm doing, like, and I'm with Virgos, so that's just not okay. Like, yeah, the yeah, lack no, of clarity, no. can't do it. Like, I was like, I was literally in Vietnam for, like, a holiday with yeah. my mom, mm-hmm. and we were on our way back from somewhere, and I was, like, writing my reflections for the year. I'm, like, sobbing, crying. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I travel to the same thing, I put my notes out. And just talk about what I want to do. Like, exactly. Who is Malika in five years? And I like, I cry too in, in flights all the time. I was just like, you're like, what are you doing? Like, this is so stupid. Like, yeah. you, are, you have zero. I was like, are you going to... My biggest fear is doing the exact same. Like, year over year, I need to see like a clear, like, this was different. You did that differently. And this is what you're going to do for 2024. Mm-hmm. The fact that I had zero ideas of like, what... 2024 is going to look like for me in terms of career in terms of like anything and I was like it's giving like 2023 energy that I'm going to do the exact same (laughs) thing and that makes me very uncomfortable so if you asked me a month ago I would have been like I'm deeply not content Mm -hmm. but 
I think when I came back to London after a bunch of traveling, I there were certain things that I was like, you know what? I there's certain things that I've been thinking about for a long time and I've just not taken the action or effort to evaluate those life choices for me. Right. I kept like ping-ponging between like the these are the pros and these are the yeah. cons of doing these things and never actually like making a step forward in either direction. And in certain things that as decisions that I've decided yeah. to evaluate, I um I'm taking the steps of like evaluating it, like certain career things and um life things and so because I'm taking a step towards a direction, it yeah. makes me feel better. Like my dad used to say this saying when I was growing up and I used to find it so silly. I don't know if he invented it or this is a thing, <laughs> but he was like, "How do you eat an elephant?" and I was like, "I don't know." And he was like, "You cut it into small pieces." So we think about the elephant all the time. Yeah. And then you're so scared about like how the hell am I going to eat this elephant? But if you just take the small steps of like taking even like today if you just reached out to someone and be like I I would like to have a chat with you about what you're doing. That is one step that you took towards a direction that you're not so sure about yeah. that will give you more clarity than you had yeah. before that conversation. So now because I feel like I've used this month to take a lot of active efforts towards potentially like you know my life going in a different direction or whatever i feel okay i wouldn't say like content that <laughs> for me that's a very strong word but i would say i feel pretty okay yeah yeah no that's good i mean you know one of our literally our first episode was about feeling lost and uncertain and uncertain mm. and like you know all of us have this time pressure to yeah. probably because maybe of social media of what's going on you know like and the and the acceleration of maturity in today's like you know yeah. um younger generation i think a lot of us have the time pressure of like you know getting it all right mm-hmm. on the first try like we can't fail you know that yeah. that pressure of course especially with the addition of you know we've come so far yeah. we have to succeed we can't go back you know our parents are supporting us they put a lot into us you know yeah. all those pressure adds up So, you know, it's it's nice to know and it's nice to see that, you know, people at the end of the day everyone has their own feelings. Not everyone has got it together. Everyone has their own emotions yeah. of yeah. of, you know, feeling lost and uncertain in different parts of life. And I yeah. think that's normal. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I think that wraps up. I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> oh my god, I was prepared for a more controversial question. <laughs> so, no, no, we're going to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to be I'm going to go easy. <laughs> such a good episode i think it's just very relatable to a lot of people out there who just think less of themselves and like question themselves every single day yeah like the three of us and yeah. i just feel like it's not very very healthy so it's just good to understand that it's totally fine to just take small steps towards a better direction and just feel exactly. content with it yeah. yeah like any effort that you make even like the sm- smallest thing it's a it's a win it's a win over you having done literally nothing about yeah. it and like another component to which is just my last two senses like <laughs> <laughs> is like being kind to yourself we're yeah. so mean to ourselves i would never talk to my friend the way i talk to myself so like just talk so to yourself true. is like a like you know you have your inner critic which you because it's you saying it to yourself you're like yeah this person's right but like if someone else said all of those things to you mm-hmm. like you're such an idiot like you're such a loser yeah. like why did you would you listen to that person no, if, no, if you no. externalize this inner critic you get mad you would be like oh piss off like how dare you talk to me like <laughs> that but your inner critic because you take it so you don't like externalize that thing you're so mean to yourself and like i've spent a long time just being so so mean to myself and i'm like i never talk to my friends like this i'm always like go for it like you can do it like whatever yeah, and you yeah. just have to give that same energy not to say i'm doing all of this like to perfection i'm pretty sure i like had an existential yeah. crisis yesterday <laughs> so it's just like it's just reminding yourself like yeah. you know you know i we talked about like our last season actually i i take therapy i think we all need therapy yes but my therapist told us i was i was in patna then my hometown and i just quit my job and i was feeling i was having a crisis too and i was like oh my what am i doing with my life love i'm wasting my time and i had therapy and she's like you are always so hard on yourself Mm-hmm. I think it's a Virgo thing as well, and she's like, "Can you tell, like, her inside of you, like, it's okay to like pause for a while because you need that. You've been doing so much since you've come to London that it's okay to like take one month off." Yeah. And I don't think I allow myself to like just feel 
good about watching Netflix one day and I feel like I'll beat myself up the next morning. I'll just like do double the amount of work. Yep. Yeah. But yep, yep, it's yep. normal to give your body the rest it needs and be okay with. It. I think I'm still struggling with it. Oh yeah. Deeply. Oh yeah. Because I quit my job like two or three months ago, so like the idea of like not having to like work, work. Right. Is literally making me feel extremely guilty. But right. I think my therapist is like you have to allow yourself to be okay when she like takes some rest and like yeah. because she needs it. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's really really good advice. But yeah, that does wrap up episode 40. <laughs> <laughs> uh interestingly Malika, me and Audrey are all like September 8th babies. We were all born on the same day. That's insane to me. And I think yeah, that's crazy. And I think that did come across a bit in the episode. I really really we really hope that you enjoyed the episode. We had a very good conversation around Yeah, I think it's definitely like, you know, it's good because you're our first female guest. That was a thrill. So, uh yeah, I think it's much more like, you know, we we have a bit more like chat, we have yeah. a bit more like conversational mm. like uh, you know, the, it was more flow, yeah. Yeah, yeah flow. I think we just get it. Like there's a similar everyone we there's get different it. struggles. <laughs> there's different struggles obviously it looks different, but there's an undertone of similarity in terms of like how bit. we're struggling yeah. with yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's good that you know we got a little bit of insight from you, and hopefully our audience, who may or may not feel the same, <laughs> can also relate to us in some kind of way. So yeah. yeah, but we really, really hope you found it helpful or like got something from it. Uh, I think the one thing that I hope, if nothing, you got from it is reassurance mm-hmm. that just have faith in yourself and yeah. everything will work out because yeah. perception truly is reality. Yeah. Yes. But be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. Exactly. Take away. <laughs> Well, this wraps up season two, episode four, four. of Let's Unwind. Yes, uh, we have a lot more female guests coming up from different walks of life, doing extremely well in their spaces. So we're very, very excited. Uh, stay tuned for next week because someone very special is coming up next as well. Mm-hmm. But this was the very end. This was episode four. Thank you so much for tuning in, like always, and watching us till the very, very end. We're very, very grateful. And we'll see you in the next one. We'll see you next week. Much love. Bye. Bye. I still don't know where to look. <laughs> <laughs>